Ah, okay. And um, and then later on, if there's time, I'm going to talk about our work in capturing behavior of humans interacting in the 3D world and also modeling such behavior. So since the beginning of civilization, we um, spent our lives interacting and perceiving other humans. And that is the society we, 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 we our ancestors lived in and the society we live in. And the human body and human interaction has depicted has been depicted in many different ways throughout art history. And nowadays, one of the ultimate goals of AI is to reproduce natural human behavior. So the history sort of continues. So now what do we mean by replicate human behavior? This means developing agents that can navigate and interact with the 3D world like humans do. This 3D world might be physical in the case of humanoid robots, or it might be virtual in the case of virtual agents. So to illustrate what I mean, I'm showing you here some result of our latest um, work on capturing people in, in context of the 3D world. This was presented at CBPR 2021 and was called Human Positioning System. And for the first time, we can capture humans interacting in, in large 3D scenes. And basically here we're using wearable sensors and we're localizing the person within the 3D scene and capturing the motion with, uh, with IMUs. And the reason I'm, I'm quite excited about this is because now we can understand better how humans plan their actions and how they perform their actions in context. And you know, this data can give us the opportunity to learn these models um, of how humans interact with the world um, from, from looking at actual real humans performing them. So there's um, also very interesting work um, performed here that your lab that we're also following in, in um, basically training agents that execute actions in simulated environments. You can already imagine that the data that we're capturing here could be used to, to make these simulated environments more and more realistic. Okay, but in this talk, I'm, I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna go um, one step backwards and look at the representations that we need in order to rep like to understand the 3D world around, around us, right? So to make these agents understand the 3D world, they need to perform some basic tasks, like for example, like reconstructing like, like 3D representations from let's say visual input, like in the easiest case would be from a single image reconstruct like, um, like the 3D representation of it, right? But depending on the visual input, you might have um, many different kinds of input data. For example, depending on whether you're using depth sensors or scanners or LiDAR, you name it, or basically like it could be an intermediate step of a computer vision algorithm. You will have input that will be sparse voxels or dense voxels or partial point clouds, for example, you would get um, from depth images. And in this case, you, this data is always deficient in some way. It lacks resolution or it lacks some parts. It, it's noisy, it misses some parts. And you would like some algorithm that is capable of com like completing the missing parts. So basically reconstructing full complete surfaces that are um, renderable and that are also like um, containing the detail that is present in the input. And for this, it's very important to choose the representation very well. So people have used, for example, voxels, but we all know that voxels have the problems that are limited by resolution. And you, when you train with voxels, you have memory problems. You could use point, points, which are much lightweight, but then you cannot easily render them. Or you could, you could use meshes, but meshes are limited in topology. You typically um, have to decide what topology you want to represent beforehand. And more recently, people have started looking at implicit surfaces and basically training neural networks to predict these implicit surfaces. And I will basically, this talk will be mostly about implicit representations, and we will see some of the advantages and disadvantages of this representation. Just to refresh your memory, in case you, you, you don't remember, you're not so familiar with this, basically implicit function means, in this case, like this is the blue boundary here, it means that you represent this blue boundary by uh, you represent this implicitly with a function that takes a value zero if the point is inside and takes a value one if the point is outside. So in this case, the function sort of classifies the points um, 
uh, inside as, as red, red squares and the points outside as, blues, as blue dots, right? And basically the surface are all these points that lie on the boundary. So basically like this, um, this surface, the blue um, boundary here are all the points for which the f of p takes a value tau. In this case would be 0 0.5 because it's right at the boundary between 0 and 1. So why is this representation particularly interesting? Because if you have a topology change, imagine you're tracking a cell or some object that changes the topology, then you can track this very easily by just like keep track of the changes of f. So with implicit function, the topology changes require only changing f, and this can be done like also in a differentiable manner. Now imagine you would be using a mesh to represent the surface, the blue line here. Well, this would be much more difficult because you would have to track like which vertices are in, in connection which, which, with, with which other vertices, and this will be um, quite difficult to, to differentiate through and would be a nightmare to implement also. So when you have topology changes, it's much more convenient to use a representation like uh, implicit services. So what people did, like three papers came up in 2019, um, that they basically implemented this using a neural network. So the idea here is to train a neural network that will classify the points as being inside or outside the surface. So this network will implicitly represent the surface. Now we're typically not interested in memorizing a single shape with a neural network. You're typically interested in conditioning in some sort of input, right? This might be a sparse point cloud or partial point cloud, or it could be an image, or it could be low resolution voxels. And then you typically encode this into a latent vector Z. And then you have this function that takes the latent vector Z and the point coordinates and classifies this point coordinates as being as inside or outside. Now, when you've classified enough of these points, you can use a classical algorithm in computer graphics, which is called marching cubes, which allows you to reconstruct the surface. In this case, it's this purple line here. So, this is nice because now at test time, you can choose the resolution. You can query more points to obtain more and more resolution. And if your model is good enough, like you will get like a much higher resolution than, you, than what you would obtain, for example, if you fix the number of vertices using a mesh based representation. So these were good news. You can represent different topologies, different objects. You have better resolution. So this was sort of a very simple idea that represented a breakthrough in the community. Um, however, we tried this for reconstructing more complex objects like humans with articulation and basically the results were not so satisfactory. We observed that limbs were often missing and also when, so here we're reconstructing the full surface given this input X, which was uh, on the left side, this low resolution voxels and on the right side is this more high resolution voxels. And what we observed is the missing limbs were a um, systematic problem. And also like when the, when the input was also more detailed, like these details were not present in the output. So this was also a problem. So we wanted to investigate deep, like, deeper what was actually the problem. So the first problem we identified is that the input lives in a 3D space. And when we're encoding it into a latent vector Z, we're losing this connection. So we're losing this loss of, we're, we're basically, we have a lot loss of 3D structure. This means that for the network, it will be more difficult to recover like the three structure that was present in the input. But perhaps more importantly, we are sending point coordinates into the decoder and point coordinates carry no information about shape because if I rotate the shape, the intrinsic shape is the same, but the point coordinates will be different. So it feels a bit arbitrary to feed a neural network with point coordinates. So how do we address these problems? Like we present a very simple idea that turns out to be very, very effective. So if the input is um, some 3D representation of the data that is noisy or incomplete or deficient in some way, what we do is we extract a multi-scale grid of deep features by 3D convolving the input. So we apply like 3D convolutions and we obtain this multi-scale grid of deep, deep features. Now, the trick here is instead of sending the point coordinates to the decoder, what we're gonna do is extract a deep feature at the continuous location within this multi-scale grid of deep features. And we're gonna send these deep features into the decoder. 
So now we take a continuous point, for example, here in the shoulder, we look up at the corresponding point in the multi-scale grid, which is aligned with the input. And basically we extract these deep features that are from global to local, right? It's like the same as a, a 2D convolutional neural network. You have at the beginning, um, you have more local details. And at the end, you have more global representation of, of the input. And so you send these um, multi-scale deep features into a decoder and you ask the network to predict either inside or outside. And mathematically, this is like, like a small change, but it makes a big difference. So basically, like we have a latent code from previous works and it has no 3D structure. And we turn this latent code into this multi-scale grid of deep features. And now instead of sending the point coordinates directly, what we do is we evaluate these deep features at these continuous point locations. So now we have the function f, I mean, it would be a different function actually, that takes the deep features and predicts the occupancy. So now these deep features do have information about the shape because we're doing three convolutions and it's extracting like different levels of like things related to curvature and like more global shape statistics. And based on those, you can make a good decision whether the point is inside or outside of the surface. And you will also be more robust to rotations and, and translations and things like that. Okay, so um, we, we tried it to reconstruct um, humans from different modalities, like for example, for low resolution voxels or high resolution voxels, or also to complete um, shapes that are like from partial point clouds. So this is the right, Example. So notice here the, the, the green dots are basically coming from a depth map. And basically we can reconstruct the occluded part of the depth map. And so what we notice is that this architecture allows us to recover detail when it's present in the input. And it allows us to recover something that is reasonable for the occluded part. So, um, this does not only work for humans, but it also works for general objects. So we um, compared to the state of the art at that time and ShapeNet and the results were not improving a little bit, but they were really significantly better as you can see here. So these are this group of works here on the left are prior works. And this is ours, which you can see that is, um, is getting quite close to the ground truth. And again, like I want to emphasize, we didn't change a lot, like we just, change one thing that made, uh, made uh, a big difference. But this, this simple idea sometimes make, um, make, make a, a significant uh, difference. All right, so um, numerically, we also uh, outperform the, the methods at that time, but um, you can check that in the paper. We also submitted this, uh, we use this method to, to compete in two challenges, uh, DCCV20 and CVPR21. These were called the sharp challenges. And basically the task there is you're given a scan that is um, basically corrupted. So it's, there's missing data and you need to complete this um, scan, like the geometry and the texture as well. And um, yeah, we were happy to, to apply this method. We didn't like adapt it at all. And then basically like um, we, we won all tracks that like both years, like in, at least CV20 and CVPR21 um, for humans and also objects, which, um, which made us happy because it's one more verification that this is um, actually an algorithm that is quite um, robust. And actually we use it for many of our other um, follow-up works. Um, so if you're working on this, like you, um, like I encourage you to apply, like this is um, well organized. This is not organized by us, it's organized by some people from the University of Luxembourg, um, but it's quite, it's very nicely set up and the, the reward is also very generous. And um, so it's also good for the students. Okay, so this fixed a little bit like the input that we're sending to the neural network, but we still have a big limitation. And this limitation is shared by all these neural implicit models on, on surfaces. And this is the fact that we're using an output representation that is based on occupancies. So we are predicting zero or one. This means that the surface needs to divide the space into inside and outside. This limits the kind of surfaces that we can represent to what are called watertight surfaces. So for example, if I want to model surfaces like open manifolds or for example, like clothing garments or general functions or complex shapes that have inner structures, 
I cannot use this representation. I can also not use the other very commonly used representation, which is the sign distance field, because that also requires to have a separation into inside and outside. So we need to change the output. So what are we going to do? Well, um, again, we strive for the simplest change that does the trick. And so here we are changing the output from a sign distance field or an occupancy to an unsigned distance field. And you might say, well, this is a trivial change. Yes, but this leads to a new algorithm um, that I'm going to describe next. So this means that you know, the representation of the input is the same as before. We use these multi-scale deep, um, deep features. And then we output the distance to the closest point Q on the surface. Right? That's, that's what this mean is returning, the distance to the surface. So if we use this, the unsigned distance field, in principle, we can represent all these open surfaces, okay? But the question is, how do we extract the surfaces once you have this unsigned distance field? Um, yeah, for notational simplicity, I'm just gonna refer as this multi-scale grid of deep features as f of p, but be reminded we are always using this multi-scale deep features as input, never the point coordinates. Okay, so we have a point cloud. And we're going to predict the unsigned distance field. We're going to get something like this, where like yellow means higher distance and colder colors mean lo lower distance. And what we want is the surface. These are the points for which the, the, sign, the unsigned distance is equal to zero. This is this blue line over here. Now the question is how we recover this, 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 um, this white line here, which is the, the surface because we cannot use marching cubes. Marching cubes requires to have a separation into inside and outside. So one idea is to look at the gradients of this distance field, which is unsigned, and we could project points outside to the surface by following the gradient direction. That might be one idea, but we can do better because look at this gradient. Like if I look at F of P, if I take the gradient, in which direction is it going to point to? It's going to point towards the closest point by definition, right? So the gradient points towards the closest point by construction. Now the question is how far do I need to move in the gradient direction in order to land in the surface? Well, the distance itself and the distance itself is provided by this neural distance field. So at the end to project any point to the surface, all we need to do is to take P which is the point we're querying. And we need to subtract the distance times the gradient after normalization, right? Well, no, the gradient is, is unit length by, by construction also. So the theoretical construction like to project the point P onto Q is F of P, which is the distance times the gradient. Okay. However, we do not have like the theoretical distance field. We have a neural distance field, which is an approximation. So in practice, we need to apply this formula like three or four times in order to project points into the surface. But basically this gives us a very fast way of predicting the, the unsigned distance, sampling points around the surface or inside the surface, and then projecting them using this very simple formula. This is a formula that um, you can find in some um, not well-known graphics papers, and it had not been used, but in our case, it's, it's crucial to make this um, efficient. Okay, so what can we do now? Like before we could do this, like for example, for this um, object here, this car, we can represent the outer surface, but we cannot represent the inner surface. The inner structures are missed here because we're using this inside outside representation. However, now we have this more powerful output representation and we can like also predict the inner structures of the surface. We can represent these inner structures of the surface because we don't need this definition of inside and outside. We can also represent open surfaces, like for example, like a garment. So here given a point cloud, we're reconstructing the dense point cloud, which is the output. And notice that then we can reconstruct the mesh, which is not a closed mesh, but it has, um, it has holes in it, right? And so we end up with a representation that is um, much more generic and the class of shapes that we can represent is much, much broader. We can also use it to reconstruct general 3D scenes. In here, like we're 
using neural, like what we call neural distance fields to reconstruct like dense point clouds from sparse point clouds. So here the input is a sparse point cloud, like you can see here, and we use neural distance fields to reconstruct the dense point cloud out of it. So the thing works as follows, you, you, you pass the sparse point cloud through these neural distance fields, you get the unsigned distance field, and then you project the points to the surface using the formula that I just showed before. And the cool thing about this is that you can train directly with the scans. You don't need to watertight them. You don't need to deal with all these things that you had to do before. You can just straightforward um, train from the, from the raw scans. Um, and then you can represent a test time, like also um, surfaces that are not necessarily watertight. Yeah, so we can also like, um, this is a, a like, an unsigned distance field, and we can use computer graphics techniques to uh, to render the depth map directly without recovering the surface. Uh, so this is like so, like a technique called sphere marching, and basically we can, if you want, you can just render the depth image given this um, unsigned distance field. We also showed um, this was a new RIPS paper, so what to show this is even more general. So we also show it for general regression tasks. So of course, if you have like a simple function, like a linear, a quadratic, you can, you can get the regression like using standard methods. You could fit, I don't know, like polynomials or you could fit a neural network or whatever. Um, but if you have like a more complex manifold that is not a function, right? For example, this spiral here. And I wanna predict, for example, for X equals zero, what is the corresponding Y? And I train using like an L2 loss, what's gonna happen here is that the network is going to produce something that is going to be an average because you have for one x you have multiple solutions right you have this multimodality so here like these standard methods will fail and here what we showed is that you can also use this to, to approximate manifolds so you can approximate this by um, predicting the unsigned distance field for this data manifold and then you can do regression by doing marching cubes along the um, constant x direction um, so yeah, we showed that this, um, this is something we're still exploring, like how we can use the, this unsigned distance field for, for more general tasks. Um, but this showed that, you know, we could use this for, for general um, regression tasks. Okay, so up to here, I've been talking about how to reconstruct surfaces from um, using a neural field representation or neural implicits. Um, I haven't talked about how to reconstruct also the appearance. And this is where um, this is a problem we addressed in stereo radiance fields, which is basically building on, on, on the well known work of NERF. And the basic idea here is to try to make NERF generalize to new scenes and try to make NERF not depend on so many dense, so many like input views um, for a particular scene. So for those of you who are not um, in this field or are not familiar with NERF, what NERF is doing is you take multiple views of a scene and then for every point, location and view direction, you train a neural network that will predict the color and the density at this location. And then once you have this neural representation of the scene, you can do volume rendering by shooting rays along um, the camera center and the pixels. And then you can basically integrate this density times the color, which is given by this neural network. Now, this is really cool. However, it because it produces really nice results and it's very simple and easy to, to use and build on it, but it seems specific. And the reason it seems specific is because you're memorizing this mapping from point coordinates and view direction to this density. So this means that you know if I change the scene, this mapping will be completely different. So I cannot leverage, like uh, I cannot train on multiple scenes to learn this, right? Because it's just memorizing the scene in the neural network. So our goal here was given sparse inputs, so not dense inputs, but given sparse inputs, like have a network that in a single forward pass could produce novel views for a novel scene. So we don't want to overfit in a, given, in, a, in a given scene. We want to generalize to new scenes. So essentially what we had before is dense input. This is NERF and a single scene. And you optimize in order to obtain a representation of the scene. Now what we want is sparse input. So we're making the problem harder. 
And we also want to generalize to new seeds. So these are the two key changes. So before we had dense, and now we have sparse. And before we had the single scene, and now we want multiple scenes. I should mention this work has um, some similarities to concurrent work, like for example, IBRNet or Pixel Nerf that, uh, that came at, at the same conference. So here we build on classical stereo. And what is the basic idea? So the basic idea of stereo is that if a point is on a surface, then when you project the point into the different viewpoints and you look at the patches, they will be photo consistent, right? However, if you query on a point that is not on the surface, the patches will not be photo consistent, okay? So that's the key idea of classical stereo. And this is reasoning about the scene. It doesn't depend on the particular scene. It's reasoning about the structure, the, the 3D structure of the scene. So the question is, how do we integrate this idea, this very simple idea, into a neural representation based on NERF? So the idea now is to take points. And again, similar as before, we don't send the point coordinates to the decoder, but rather we project the point into each of the viewpoints. And we extract the deep feature, one for each of the viewpoints. And we arrange these deep features into pairs. Right, So we compare image one with two, image one with three. We, we look at all possible combinations and we extract these paired deep image features. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna train an ensemble of similarity functions that will be learned that will look at these pairs of deep features. So the, the, the task of these, these learned similarity functions is to perform this like um, comparison of like, you know, that you would do with stereo where you compare pairs of patches. So ideally like this uh, ensemble, we look at whether the point is on the surface or not in the surface by looking at the photo consistency between different viewpoints. And we have several of them so that, you know, the model has more capacity to learn other aspects, like for example, color or things like that. So once you've processed that, you obtain like what we call the stereo features, which will be of dimension S times K, S is the number of pairs, and K is the number of similarity functions that we learn. And so we obtain this, um, this matrix of features, and then we don't want a dependency on the number of pairs, so that's why we do max pooling here, and over the number of pairs. And in the end, we obtain what we called like the, we, we call this the correspondence encoding. And then we send this to this radiance field decoder, which will finally predict the RGB and density for that point. So notice that we're not memorizing like the, the mapping from coordinates to density and color, but we're now reasoning about the actual scene. So this will allow us to train this network using multiple scenes and will also allow us at test time to um, generalize to a new scene. Because notice that now we're projecting the points into the image, right? And so we're, the network can make a decision based on local image statistics instead of making, uh, instead of memorizing a mapping from coordinates to density. Okay, so let's see this in action. So here we have 10 input images of a novel scene. This is not a scene that we've seen during training. And we have two modes of operation. The first one is we just send the images and we push them through the neural network. This is like what we call instant result. This requires, it's Im immediate, the result is immediate. And the other one is a fine tuned result where we use these 10 images to fine tune the representation using only these 10 images. Um, so I'm gonna show you the, these two modes of operation. So you see that like, um, yeah, first I'm showing you ours fine-tuned and then I'm showing the instant result, but let me show you this again. And so see that the fine-tuned result on the left is a bit better, but um, the instant result is also, is also quite good already. So it's showing the generalization ability um, is obtained by, by using these um, ideas, right? This architecture that is inspired by, by stereo, multi-view stereo. All right, so how does this compare to, for example, standard NERF or LFFF, which were um, the baselines at that time? Well, 
nerve fails in not, not for all scenes, but for many scenes it fails because it needs many more images in order to produce a reasonable um, scene representation. So if you have only 10 images nerf many times, it, it's just not enough and it doesn't learn anything meaningful. Um, instead, ours like can produce <clears throat> already like um, a pretty good new novel view synthesis result by just looking at these 10 images without even, a, even having to, to train in them. So here are more results um, of um, our method generalizing to new scenes. And again, like I emphasize that we're using only 10 images. And I mean, similar to, to, to NERF, we can also, um, oops, sorry. We can also obtain like three reconstructions um, by, by, um, by looking at the density and doing marching cubes on the density. Okay. Good. So up to here, I've shown representations that are good for novel view synthesis or for reconstruction, but I haven't shown how to control these representations. And in many graphics applications, you're interested in also controlling these representations. Um, so here I want to present a work that we presented at ICCB, which is called NeuroGIF. And what we do is we control a neural implicit representation or a neural implicit surface um, as a function of pose. So the goal here is given some scans of a person in multiple poses, we want to learn a model that then can generalize to new poses. So I can control this model with a skeleton, for example, and we can generate new poses. And the, the task is to produce the wrinkles and the deformations so that it looks realistic. Now, classically, how you would solve this problem was using a very complex pipeline where you would do registration, you would, you would not really deform a mesh to the data, and then you would learn like statistics from it. And it, it's a very complicated pipeline. And here instead, we just take raw scans and we learn using this neural implicit representation, we learn um, to generalize to new poses. And here we build an idea that um, dates back to at least SIGGRAPH 91 by Sklarov and Pendland, probably the, at MIT actually. And the idea is like generalized implicit functions. So the idea is like, how do you deform a shape? How do you tra apply transformations to a shape? For example, if I want to apply a rotation and translation to a given implicit surface, which is defined like this, right? This equation over here that I shown before, how do you do that? So you can do something very simple, which is, Consider a point, right? This point, this blue dot that I'm marking here. And I wanna know whether it's inside or outside. What I can do is I can like apply the inverse transform to look back in the original untransformed space, whether the point is inside or outside. And I can just copy this value over here. This is exactly what this formula is doing here. It's saying this implicit function after the transformation are all these points P prime in the transformed space, such that when I apply the inverse transform, right, this function evaluates to tau, which is the boundary between inside and outside. So this is the implicit function in the untransformed space, and this is the implicit function in the transformed space. And notice that the only thing that changes is the thing that we're sending into the input of this function. So this gives us a very nice way of broadening the class of shapes that we can represent. So for example, you can generalize this to general deformation fields. You could have a deformation field that varies over X, Y, and Z to obtain more like general stretching and scaling. And so basically you can do the same trick. You can apply the inverse transform and, and look at the points that are right to the boundary. So we started looking at this idea um, in a collaboration with, uh, with uh, Google Brain in Toronto. And this was the paper called NASA, where we have control over neural implicit using something similar to what I just described. Um, so where we can control the, the implicit surface with, with a skeleton. And this sparkled interest. And then there were like in the next conference, like many papers trying to build also um, implicit surfaces that are controllable with, with articulation. But none of these works produces like a model that can control the articulation and also non-rigid deformations of a surface. 
And this is what we presented in NeuralGIF. This is the difference between um, NeuralGIF and, and this prior work. Um, so just to draw analogies with what would be the classical way of approaching um, this, this statistical modeling of, of, of shapes, I want to present like what, what the, the mathematical form of the simple model, which is a model of, of body pose and shape, which we developed a few years ago. So basically, you start with a, with a template shape, and then as a function of pose and shape, you apply a set of displacements. Once set of displacement is a function of the shape identity. And this displacement is like, it's like a, a vector field applied at the vertices of the mesh. And then you have another vector field due to pose, which accommodates for things like muscle bulging and deformations that happen due to articulation. And then finally, you apply the non-rigid transformations, like the articulated transformations. Now, because we work with implicit functions instead of meshes, the thing works in reverse mode. So you start in the deformed space and you want to figure out for the points in this deformed space, whether they are inside or outside the surface. So you will apply the inverse transforms. So basically for this point, you will train a neural network that brings this pose at this point into the canonical space with this inverse mapping here. And then you have another network that learns a displacement field in this canonical space, which is a function of the pose. And in the end, you have like an SDF that takes this um, point with this uh, undeformed, this inverse transformations and evaluates the SDF. This is a sign distance field that evaluates whether the point is inside or outside. And by doing this, right, we are like these three operations that we apply here. This is like deforming the underlying space. And this is broadening the class of shapes that we can represent without having to change the sign distance field at all. And this allows you to represent much more, um, much richer details in the end. So this here are some results where we can um, generalize to new poses and notice that um, these, there's this effect of layering of the clothing on top of each other. And also we can represent like fine wrinkles. And basically we can, um, we can almost reproduce the quality of, of the input draw scan data. Sorry, I want, I want to bah, let me just. Um, so the good thing is that this model can be applied to any data set. We can um, basically train with any sort of raw scan data. The only thing that it requires that we fit, we, we should know for every scan what the corresponding pose of the simple model is. And then once we know this, we can train directly um, the model that I described it before. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, I'm just, um, Kind of forward mode this a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna skip these things uh, and also this. Yeah, I want to mention that of course there's a lot of work that I didn't cover in this like uh, neural implicit um, representations and you know the field is evolving very fast. There's lots of works that um, it's it's really difficult to keep track of. Um, there's this GitHub repository by, by your colleague, Vincent, who's keeping track of the works at least last year was quite well updated. There's also a review paper coming up. So that's also some ways of keeping up with, with the work that is happening. Okay, and just at the very end of the talk, very quickly, um, I will not get into a lot of detail for this part, but I want to give you a gist of the work we're doing in capturing and modeling human behavior. So, at the beginning, I was mentioning that it, one of the goals of AI should be to train agents that can interpret the world and perform actions in the world. And I think one way of training these agents is by looking at how humans are actually doing this. Uh, so in this work, we want to capture how humans interact in the 3D world. And um, basically the idea here is to use like wearable sensors like IMUs to capture the motion However, with IMUs, the problem is that they drift over time. And also you don't have a way to know where the person is within the 3D scene. So in this project, we were first pre-scanning the 3D world where the person, the real person would interact. And then the goal, what we want to solve is like we want to solve for the motion of the person and at the same time localize where the person is in the 3D scene. And how we did this is we used visual localization. So here on the left, when you see Rio, it means this is the camera viewpoint as seen from the head camera mounted on the person. And on the right hand side, you see 
the synthetic 3D wall. This is the 3D scan as rendered from the camera that we localized. So if the left matches with the right, it means that we're doing a good visual, visual localization um, job. So basically this is a person walking and on the left you have the real image, on the right you have the synthetic scan. And then basically the idea is to merge the information coming from visual localization, from IMU, and at the same time integrate the constraints of the 3D world because the 3D world places constraints on the person. The person cannot intersect with the walls, cannot intersect with the ground. Typically, like, you know, the, the food will not slide along the ground. And constraints like this, we can integrate into an optimization framework in order to obtain a, a motion that is coherent with the 3D world. And um, yeah, this is the kind of motions that we were able to recover. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail, but the basic idea is to integrate these three sources of information. And uh, what is cool is that now we can, you know, this was for the first time like um, an algorithm that could capture like this kind of motion of people in context with the 3D scene where the scene is larger than just a small room. Right? That's something that you could not do, for example, with external cameras because then the recording volume is always limited to a small room. And, and what is interesting is that from this data, like we're hoping to learn like, um, agents that can perform these actions, like for example, grabbing a book from the shelf um, in a realistic manner, like, like real humans do. Right, this data set, by the way, is um, publicly available. So the results are publicly available and also the code to, to obtain the results. It's um, actually all the works that I presented have um, publicly available code. So we capture different actions, for example, like interacting with a computer. And notice that here we're not using an external camera, we're just um, tracking from the head-mounted camera and also from the um, IMUs at the same time. And we also captured interactions between um, two people. We also captured other kinds of interactions, for example, interacting with a, with a, with a ball or with objects. And notice that here we're not tracking the objects. And this was one of the limitations of the work. The, the scene is static, so we can track only the human motion, but we cannot track the objects, right? So here, obviously, the object is missing, right? Um, let me move forward. Yeah, so, so now very recently, what we're looking into is given the same setup, given a static scan, like what we had before, and this IMU data, right? and also the egocentric view of the person, of a person moving or interacting an with an object, can we recover both the human motion and the object motion? That's the research question that we're posing. Now you can already imagine this is a super hard problem because like when the person is interacting with the object, that's what you see in the camera, right? There's no hope for visual localization. You have no features, no reference points, and there's also very little hope for localizing the object relative to the human. So it is really difficult to solve this problem if you're not doing some higher level reasoning. So in, 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 in this ongoing work, what we're able to recover is the motion of the human and the object simultaneously. So just to state the research question again, the problem setup is the following. You have the visual localization, like. The, when the person approaches the object, you typically can localize the object. During interaction, you don't know what's happening because the object is like too close to the camera or you don't have reference points. And then after the interaction happens, typically you still can see the object. And so the question is like, given this information of where the object was before the interaction and where the object is after the interaction, can we figure out what happened in between? And the answer is, well, partially yes, making a number of assumptions, we can recover the motion of the human and the object. So I don't have time to explain the algorithm, but here what we're using is the fact that if the object is uh, in contact with, with a human, then it should satisfy the contact constraints. It should follow the human motion. If the object is heavy, like, um, like a chair, like what you see here, it's reasonable to assume that the object can only be dragged along the floor. If you're moving a door, it's reasonable to assume that it will only move along the hinge joint, 
right? So these are the kind of um, reasoning that we're incorporating. <clears throat> so for example, here, I'm showing you the result you obtained with this previous CBPR work, the human positioning method. And you see that the person like, like goes through the door because we're not reasoning about dynamic scenes. And so basically this is a complete failure because it's not something that the algorithm can, can actually do. And now with, with our new work, we can recover the human motion and the, the, the object motion as well by reasoning jointly about um, the interaction between the object and, and the human. And notice that we're not seeing the object from the camera. Like it's so close that you don't see any, anything useful, right? So you have to rely on this interaction to recover the object motion. Um, yeah, just to emphasize this, like, we, and you also have to reason about the context because like, otherwise you end up with motions that are really not realistic. All right, so you might ask why, why not capturing this interaction with external cameras? Well, some applications like in VR, AR re require just using wearable devices. You cannot afford to put a camera in every corner of your house. Um, also, egocentric capture is better for unconstrained volumes. And it's, um, yeah, it's a setup that also mimics more like how we drag with the 3D world. However, for small objects and confined scenes, if what we're interested in is in just capturing good quality data to learn models from it, it makes sense to also develop algorithms that work from external cameras. And we're also working on this. I'm not gonna describe this in detail, but that's something that, um, that we're working on, hopefully will come up at some point soon. And basically this is a data set of human object interactions, uh, which we captured with three Kinects and a new method in order to obtain these high quality um, um, results. So basically you have the human motion and the, um, the object. And we are basically reasoning about the context between the human and the object and also um, the interactions between them. And so that's something that we're looking more and more at the interaction of humans and objects. And this relates very much to the first part of the talk. Like here, we're also using neural, neural implicits to, to reconstruct the object and to find correspondences between the object and, and the human and so on. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip um, the details of the method and I'm just gonna jump to um, like future directions and the conclusions. So basically in this talk, I've shown that neural implicits are indeed very flexible and um, for the future, I think it's interesting to think about questions like, can we use this neural implicit representations as internal maps for agents that interact with the 3D world? So, I mean, is, is there a connection between this, you know, these two parts of the talk, like where, like I use these representations maybe to, for action, right, as well. Um, so that's, that's an interesting question that we would like to address. And also how can we build these implicit representations on the fly and maybe like with some, um, with some memory, right? So that you're maybe more detailed for the scene where, like the place where you are, but then you have some rough memory of how things look like far away from where you are and things like that. This is also all very um, interesting and exciting for the future. All right, so, um, so neural implicits are very flexible for multiple topologies. In several papers, we've been, um, arguing that it's better to, to send to the decoder deep shape features instead of point coordinates. And um, the output representation also matters a lot. For example, I showed that if you choose like the unsigned distance, you can represent much more shapes than if you choose an occupancy representation. And we're seeing more and more works. I just presented ours, but there's more, more and more works in making these neural implicit models actually controllable. And this is also an, an exciting avenue for future research. And um, yeah, I think it's very exciting to think about what's the connection between like this 3D shape representations and, and, the, and humans and performing actions in, in 3D worlds. And with this, I would like to um, thank um, yeah, funding agencies and sponsors, and I'll be happy to take questions now. Okay, and perhaps before anyone asks a question, I can ask a quick question. Um, yeah, I guess it's 
I'm not sure how much you can talk about it because it's, I, I'm curious about your latest work on uh, hops, right? So I yeah. think in one of your slides, you show that um, you have the map before the object interaction and you have a map after the object interaction and you are trying to solve in between, right? So do you, uh, so does it mean that you already, like one after the interaction, then you build the map again to help you, like the, the thing on the right, did you build that again or did you infer the motion and generate this map on the fly as well? So I guess I'm slightly lost over here. Yeah, so just to, yeah, I mean, this was very fast. It was just, uh, it was more to like, <laughs> like as a teaser than, than as, as to, to make you understand. So basically, um, one thing should be clear, we are not building a map we're using SLAM, we could do that. But here we're using a static scene as, as, a, like as a reference. And what we're doing is localizing the object, right, within that, um, within that scene. The object has moved, right? It could be in a different location than what it, than when it was when we scanned the um, the building. That happens all the time. So what what we say by what what I mean by here localization, it means that we're focusing on just one object, right? For focusing on this paper, and then basically we localize the object within the scene, and we assume that we get one at least one good frame where we can localize the object correctly before and after the interaction. That's the assumption. I mean, the problem is so difficult that we had to make a number of assumptions to start working with it. But I think it's an interesting research question to think about. And I think there's going to be more on this. Is it, does it clarify? Oh, yep, yep, yep. Great, thank you. Um, I think Antoni has a question. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, first, there are these amazing words I have to say. And I cannot even imagine how complex is this pipeline. I was wondering on the map representation though, like it does seem to me that you're using a point cloud. Why not use it? Why are you not using a 3D mesh or maybe you are uh, for the representation of the scene? And why not pre-processing it as in, okay, like let's think compose it into objects, uh, rooms, um, floor, ground walls and uh, doors. Is there such a composition already in the framework? No, not not yet. Uh, but that's that's. Uh, I mean, yeah, we we should probably do that. Like some like processing into semantics, and then um, then yeah, like capturing these interactions after we've processed the scene. The the scene looks like point clouds because it's just for rendering. But for um, in the in the original paper to include constraints, we are using the mesh to to look at like intersections. So this is just for visualization purposes. But now, like, bear in mind one thing. Right now, we're focusing on a, an object at a time. So we're just, we know which object we're going to interact with. The real deal is, I don't know what I'm going to interact with, and then I can track everything. But we're, we're, we're not there yet. But um, that, that's, that's basically what we should head towards. Yeah. So I actually, we, we look at, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, sorry, I interrupted you, I think. What were you going to say, Gerard? That we, we looked at your framework, Chimera, also um, at the initial stages. And then, um, so it's something we're, we're looking at. So yeah, we're, we're also aware of your work. Also awesome stuff. Awesome, good to know. Thank you for answering. Yeah, so I think one quick follow-up regarding Antonio's question. So since you said you only focus on one object at a time. So I assume that you also have some assumption on the object motion do, or do you kind of infer these? Yes. That, yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, that that's something that we're looking at at inferring the degrees of freedom for the object. Right now we're assuming, like we, we, we make the assumption that we say, this object can only move in the X, Y plane and the rotation, the door can only move along the hinge joint. But um, but it would be cool to infer these degrees of freedom, right? Automatically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, are there other questions from the audience? Okay. I guess no. Then that's thanks, Gerard, again for the great talk. Thank you, Gerard. Thanks.